I'd like to thank Chairman Scientific Committee, Dr. Lalit Verma, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this scientific extravaganza. I also like to extend a warm welcome to all the delegates on this instruction course in endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis, as we all know, is the most dreaded complication of any intraocular surgery. And we ophthalmic surgeons do not at all want to come in encounter with it. But if we do have to encounter this, we should be well prepared and with all the things in our armamentarium. So herein, in this IC, we'll be discussing all the guidelines and protocols, including the AIOS guidelines and the NABH guidelines for the prevention and management of endophthalmitis. I also extend my thanks to my co-instructors who have agreed to be a part of this instruction course. I invite my co-instructors on the stage, Dr. Satang Mathur from Uttarakhand, Dr. Jalpa Vashi from Bangalore, please come to the dais, Dr. Himadri Chaudhary from Silchar Assam, please come to the dais, Dr. Ajay Arora will be joining us shortly. The first talk will be given by Dr. Satangshu Mathur. He will be talking on pre, per, and post-operative protocols for prevention of endophthalmitis. Good morning. Thanks, Dr. Madhi. I will be speaking today very less because my throat is not supporting me. Everything in the, on the... The guidelines, protocols are AIS guidelines and ESR, ESCRS guidelines. You can mention these guidelines in the court of law if some time you are catching the court. The five possible factors, they alone or in combination are responsible for end of the patient personal hygiene, contaminated surgical supplies, faulty selection procedures, and advert touch environment. If you take care of these five things, you can prevent endothermitis. And our aim is March to zero endothermitis in 2020. We will take one by one. Preoperative, yeah, everybody knows this. I will not take much time. Belephritis, congenitalitis, lacrimal obstruction is a very important thing. And eyelid abnormality, like entropy and belephritis. Diabetes is a very important thing. Thorough preoperative clinical evolution is very important in cathartic cases. <coughs> this blood sugar. This is norms. You can mention court of, I was in the court of one upon time, 176 random blood sugar patient File a case against me, I have operated in 176 patient in infection happens. I show these guidelines, I was saved in the court of law. 120 less than fasting and random less than 200, you are saved in the court of law. You are saved in the court of law. Urine routine conject does not, not required in every case. But syringing, it should do, it will, if we do, we should not do on the same day. Culture only in uh, cases of who have previously infection. But instruction to the patient, what you will give preoperatively. Broad spectrum antibiotics should be given six times a day, one day before surgery. Not before three, four days before surgery, we were giving people. Patients should come with face wash, hairs with soap, male should shave, ladies should wash their hairs because we have to avoid hair washing for five, seven days, and clean clothes should be worn. What instruction to the patient, the staff? If biometry you have to do, you should not do on the same day. If you have to do same day, it should be not the contact method, immersion method. And if you have a list of 10 patients, you have diabetes patient too, you should operate diabetic patient first. Then how to clean the patient in the OT? How to prepare the patient? Clear the bro region. We should not clean on the eye. We should clear the whole of the bro region face up to the other part. With 10% iodine solution available in the market. This is well proven now. Iodine, 5%, two times, topically, five minutes before surgery, is better than giving antibiotic one day before surgery. Then all things everybody knows. Silly, this everybody knows how to wear cure growth count. It's going be very important. We should have this chart above our washing area, and not for us, but for our staff. We never check our staff has washed for one minute, five minutes, ten minutes. He's touching the instruments. So we should take care. I have put a camera in the scrubbing area just to make them afraid that I am watching them and sitting in the downstairs so that they should not come out with one minute scrubbing. <clears throat> so this is very important. 
draping very important. Now good drapes are available. Here eyelashes should not be coming out. It should be covered by the drapes. Then important is surgical supply. We have heard so many times in infection happened in the OT because of irrigating fluids or something. Should check expiry date and packing before opening anything in the OT. We should invert the bottle and should check there is any particle in the bottle or not because most culprit areas dry fluid. Ideal is one irrigating bottle for one patient, but it is not possible in developing countries like India. But we should change three of, after three or four cases. Antibiotic irrigating fluid, we were using previously, but it has proven it has no role now. Subconjunctivity, definitely it has a role. Intercom antibiotic, we give in only high risk cases, diabetic patient or some risk cases. Otherwise, in normal, we do not give. Now, Haripiria has come with two lakh cases. His, it's such that intercommon antibody is useful, but we are giving only in the cases of, it is ESCR is also saying only in the high risk cases. <clears throat> During surgery, high speed autoclave should be there. We should maintain temperature. We should maintain pressure. We should maintain the duration of time. That is very important. Or if you do not have high speed duration, then you should have adequate number of surgical cases. If you have to operate five cases, you should have five sets. Autoclave is better than ETO. Temperature and pressure should be maintained. I will tell you just why. <clears throat> indicators. These are physical indicators we are putting over the dump. But this shows only that temperature has reached up to that level. That does not show temperature has maintained for a um, sufficient amount of time for sclation. So for this, we have chemical indicators. The chemical indicators told, tell us that we have achieved the pressure and Sustained pressures were sustained for sufficient time to maintain a slicing proper if it has come to the pass area. If it has not come to the pass area, that is failed. Biological indicators are for autoclave. We should also see the autoclave is not infected, so we should use once in a month the biological indicators. Now, most important OT is the flow cleaning. Most of the parts, I may be overlapping with them. Flow should be cleaned with wet mop. Everything will spread on the instruments. OT flow, totally everything should be cleaned daily. For that, we have basilar solution available in the market. We should clean with it. Floor is the most culprit area in the operation center. You should clean it. You should not throw your gown and gloves out to each case on the ground. You should put in the dustbin. Keep the floor dry. You can use dry humidifier. Walls and ceilings are really contaminated, not should be cleaned daily. We can clean in every month, once in a month. Most important, the floor that you should clean daily with below the, uh, the bench, uh, this, uh, I have told you, solution, basilar solution, daily. Fumigation is not indicated nowadays. It is a cancerous. It has been ruled out from our uh, curriculum. But if we have to use formaldehyde, we can use once a week. This new things have come, many solutions have come for the cleaning. That is, this hydrogen peroxide run 11%, the benzyl chloride, there are many things, alcohol preparation, they have come for, I've seen today, there's some alcohol preparation also in the market available for cleaning the floor. Basal acid, commonly we are using it, it is available in the market easily for cleaning of the floor. Ultraviolet radiation, we can have added advantages if we do for 12 to 16 hours before the surgery. This is very important. My sources are collected from various locations of OT. From where? Operation table, over headlamp, floor, four, four walls, floor below the head end of the table, instrument tolly, AC duct, and microscope handles. We should take culture swab every month, and we should, documentation very important nowadays. We should keep this swab in a main register. Article register should be separate, and this culture reports should be separate. You should put, I always take a receipt from my friend. Either I don't pay my pathologist, but I take a receipt from him. That's to show that we have done this culture regularly. This should be maintained in the OT register. Scrub clean, you should clean the scrub sink daily. AC filter, I, I, nowadays we have uh, having this uh, centralized, but if you have, uh, while mounted, you should clean the AC filter every week. 
OT lay out just short me because she will cover. OT should be separate from the public movement. Style and style area should be separated. OT should have seamless walls, non-porous floor. Doors should be kept, kept closed always. Dusted the movement inside out. Once somebody inside should not go out. Kilchal sensitivity should be taken once in a month. And samples I have take, told you from where to take. We should plan joining. That the protective zone, clean zone, style zone, disposal zone. These are different things that you should have in the different zones. What area should be in the different zones? When you plan OT, according to NABH, child should be 20, 20, 10. Glass window should be one side. Door should be sliding. These are things you should do while you are planning the OT because the NABH requirements are this. Ventilation. Central air conditioning, split AC, window AC, no. Laminate flow, if it, it is very good. Air selection should have specific filters. Parameters should be into OT, temperature 20 to 24, humidity 50 to 60 percent. Fan should not be used in the OT at all. This is a ventilation process. Water tank, this thing we usually we forget. Water tank. We never go to upstairs and see what is the condition of water tank. We should clean water tank once in a month and we should keep a record, not for the court but for ourselves, to make our staff aware that he has cleaned or not in a month. So this should be maintained as uh, we have cleaned the water tank. These are the daily checklists we should have in the OT, should be signed by OTS stand, should be countersigned by you. This is make you and your staff alert always that we are taking care. These are checklists I will not like to emulate. You can read out. Who check preoperative checklist, who check articulate tip, who filled them out. Everything should be documented. So staff will be always alert, I am going to sign. It, I am responsible for it. So he will take care. Otherwise, nobody take care. This is all list. You have distributed? Yes. We are distributing the leaflets here. Yeah, we have the checklist in the handout. So those who want can take the handout in front of the stage. I have kept few handouts. This is very important. You should in the OT and you should keep with you. The weekly checklist, because you're getting, so I am going fast. Who cleaned AC, who keeps cements clean, everything is written. You should have. The expired date of medicine should be very important. This is a monthly checklist. Every month you should check like this, what things are going there. Who check. So everything is just to make your, you and your staff alert and be active. And so if you take all these precautions, patient will be happy. A big thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Satang Shumathur. He has helped me a lot in the preparation of this instruction course. I'd like to extend my warm thanks to him. The next talk will be given by Dr. Jalpa Vashi. We will be talking on NABH protocols in endophthalmitis. Dr. Jalpa is consultant, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. She is the visiting consultant, Zamindar Microsurgical Eye Hospital. She is NABH assessor and faculty for I for Quality program. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes uh, you have a question? Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Mathur, Dr. Mathur has disappeared. You are here, no? Uh -huh. <laughs> I have uh, So uh, you have mentioned about the blood sugar level, but uh, you have not mentioned anything about hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin is not... We have required for us, madam, because we have no bleeding without cataract surgery. And uh, for, but nowadays, one important thing has come, which is not mentioned which slide before. Recently, a paper was published here, uh, HIV infection, virus, hepatitis. This should be, should go, we should think of it, because he has given a very good criteria. 12% cases have got given. Hemoglobin eyes are never mentioned, madam. Okay, ma'am, I'll answer the question. I'll answer, back, I'll, I'll answer your question. I just want to add hemoglobin. Sometimes back, a CMA series on endophthalmitis came. It was published by AIUS. So they said that hemoglobin A1C should be less than 7. Okay, let me answer that question, ma'am. Uh, uh, the AOS criteria, and which we have been actually fighting with them, AOS criteria is a random blood sugar of 200. Huh, yes. Right? Yes. This is the AOS criteria even for intravitreal injections. Okay. They do not talk about hemoglobin A1, A, A1C, but if you look at the literature, because I was involved with the Avastin blaster, uh, blunder which occurred uh, with the government of India, 
I was, I had myself prepared a 243 page document for AOS and we won the case uh, when Avastin came back into circulation. So at that time, we had an internal discussion. So there are two trials known as the Rise and Ride trial yes. for diabetic retinopathy. Yes. There, the upper limit for hemoglobin A1C for the injections was 10. DRCR.net does not talk about blood sugar, but their upper limit for intravitreal injections was 12, right? So then we looked at, there is, a, uh, there is a study published on total hip replacement in the journal of British Journal of Anesthesia. They did this study comparing surgical results with hemoglobin A1C, and they went up to a blood level of about 243, which corresponds to about 9.1 or 9.2 hemoglobin A1C. So what you are saying is absolutely right. When you have a level of hemoglobin A1C put as a criteria in legally, it will become very difficult for us to handle. Because hemoglobin A1C indicates the last three months uh -huh, sugar. Yes, so yes. on that day, what is the blood sugar? We don't know. So if a person has been very poorly controlled for last three months, but has been well controlled for last one week, we will never be able to operate. So I don't think hemoglobin A1C should be listed as a criteria. You can have blood sugar, but not hemoglobin A1C. Anyway, I, I actually I'm quoting the AIUS CMA series. Next point is uh, in the same uh, literature, it was in that antibiotics should be given for 48 hours preoperatively, antibiotic drops, not one day. It is uh, 48 hours. Because these things are very important yeah, for yeah, us. It's very important. Another thing is that regarding the syringing. Syringing, the, in the same series, they told that syringing is not, not required, required in all right. cases. Yeah. We'll do it only if there is a patient is complaining of watering. That is one. And if you press it, ro plus is positive. These are the two indications so, for so doing we syringing. Will, we, will, we will take the questions in the end, but just to answer this particular question, if you have a one-eyed patient, if you have a diabetic patient, if ro plus is positive, then yes, you should do syringing. Otherwise, and in these cases, you actually do a conjunctile swab. Yes, yes. So if you don't have these cases on a routine, you just press over the sac huh, area. Huh, that's, that's yeah, so that is what hmm. should be done. Hmm. Okay, I think you. let's go ahead with the discussion and we can have the uh, okay. discussion in the end. Yeah, we'll have the panel discussion at the end of the talk. Uh, I'd request Dr. Jalpa to please continue. So good morning, everybody. My topic is NABH protocols in prevention and management of endophthalmitis. Now this endophthalmitis word itself can give us sleepless nights and none of us would like to have it even in our, during our lifetime. So how many of us are actually prepared if something like this happens to us in case of, in terms of documentation, especially? So let us learn how NABH protocols would help us in preventing infection and uh, safeguarding us in case if infection happens. Now who is responsible when uh, infection happens, whether it's operating surgeon, OT staff, your uh, assisting surgeon, CSST in charge, OT support staff, or infection control nurse, or third party like consumables or IULs, or some web process failures in sterilization if we don't execute surgical safety checklist properly, or we don't implement reuse policy or multi-dose vials, or entire infection control program which would lay down all these policies. So in NABH there are 10 chapters and out of 10 chapters, 4 chapters would have covered uh, some policies regarding infection control, documentation and quality assurance. So let us know all these guidelines. Now regarding prevention. So as per guidelines, our surgery patient record should contain these following points. But in these, the most important ones are preoperative assessment by the operative surgeon, where we have to mention about negative history of any infection, local infection, MGD, say sac block or uh, uncontrolled uh, diabetic uh, diabetes or any other systemic illness. Consent, definitely yes, because it carries your legal value. Surgical safety checklist, I'll discuss this later. Operative notes. Implant details, uh, we have to mention uh, about implant details. So generally we put our sticker, implant sticker or IL sticker in the master logbook, which should carry the batch number. Post-operative care plan, which would talk about antibiotic policy and discharge summary. This is very important. We have to mention about 
the instruction how and when to obtain urgent care in case of emergency, say if your patient has redness or sudden diminution of vision or pain. Now this is the surgical safety checklist which is uh, an initiative by WHO in order to ensure uh, uh, safety of the, all the patients who are undergoing the surgery. It has three phases, sign in, time out and sign out. Sign in is just before induction of anesthesia, time out is before incision, sign out is before patient leaves the operating room. Now this we can modify as per our ophthal need. But if you see in sign in they have mentioned about the patient identity confirm consent form in time out they have mentioned about sterility part whether ensure or not or uh, uh, profile excess of antibiotic is ensure or not. And we can also mention about the consumables which we are going to use during the surgery. Uh, regarding operation theater, I may not go much into detail, Dr. Hemant is going to cover, but avoid mix of sterile and unsterile stuff. Patient, personal and material flow should be unidirectional. There should be safe usage and sharing of consumables because we are going to use BSS, viscoelastics or some intracameral injections in uh, many of patients. So uh, the thing is we have to uh, uh, make policy on that. How, uh, in policy we have to mention how we are going to ensure the sterility of the part when the same consumable is used in two, three patients. And there should be documentation of each consumable used during surgery in each patient. So if BSS is used in five patients, then that BSS batch number should be mentioned in all these five patients' records. Quality assurance program for OT, like OT surveillance, that is to check for efficacy of OT cleaning and disinfection that we do once in a month or once in 15 days, culture reports. HU monitoring, that should be daily for uh, monitoring humidity, temperature, and pressure differential. Integrity of the filter can be checked once in 15 days. CSSD surveillance, that is by Bovidic test, that is before starting the load, we have to uh, indicate this uh, test. And then biological indicator, that uh, as per guidelines, it should be once in a week. Now, uh, the third chapter that is the management of medication talks about multi-dose vials. In our, our ophthal, we use antibiotics, lignocaine, anti-VJ, mitomycin, the same vial in, again, couple of patients. So again, we have to have SOP on that, how we are going to maintain the sterility part, how long we are going to store, and how we are going to store. And as soon as we open any vials, we have to mention the date of opening. Uh, regarding infection control program, now our hospital must have this uh, manual on infection control program which should include many policies. Now policies on standard and uni universal precautions which would include hand hygiene, safe injection practice, blood and body fluid exposure, needle stick injury, personal protective equipment, sterilization. And we have to define high risk areas in our hospital. We must have protocols on cleaning, disinfection and sterilization. Surveillance activity, again, for OT and CSSD. Then we have to have policy on risk identification and risk management. We'll discuss this. Antibiotic policy for uh, uh, avoid irrational use of antibiotic. Reuse policy. Budget. Budget is very important because when uh, we must have budget for infection control program, which shows that uh, commitment of management towards the infection control practices. KPAs. So that is key performance indicators. This we have to, uh, uh, this we use to monitor the efficacy of all the processes which we have laid down. And trainings, yeah, of course, trainings for all our staff in terms of infection control practices. Hospital must have one infection control nurse. This nurse would uh, ensure that whether all the processes are in place and it will, and she will, all, she or she will ensure about the uh, training part also. Infection control team, ideally one microbiologist should also be a part of this team. This team will lay down all the policies. An infection control committee, this committee should meet once in a uh, three to four months and this committee will review all the policies as well as if some adverse event has happened in past, they will discuss all these things. Now what is risk reduction protocols? This is to minimize or abolish the chances of infection in the eye and how to do that? So surgery prerequisite, like we, uh, we have to take extra care in high risk surgeries like patients with HIV or HBS positive or uncontrolled diabetics where pa if patient is on dialysis, they'll have fluctuating uh, sugar level, then we have to take care. Preoperative antibiotic protocol, preparation of prepa a patient before and during surgery, post-operative care, which will include your antibiotics, schedule follow-up, and then early detection of any infection. 
your uh, the uh, OT etiquette for staff and doctor should be very stringent. There should be disinfection protocol before, in between, and after surgery. Surveillance protocols again, KPIs, and of course OT infrastructure as per NABH guidelines. Now, what is reuse policy? So, some of the instruments like FECO tips, sleeves, vitrectomy cutter, cassettes, we use in a couple of patients. We reuse it, reuse them. So, and as per manufacturer's guidelines, they should be disposable ones. They should not be used again. So, but still we can use it, and we have to. The thing, main thing is we have to make policy on that. And in that policy, we have to list out the items which can be reused, how many times and mark in item after every use. So if you have decided that 10 times only you are going to use it, then mark each time, and then after 10 times you can discard, or you can discard early if it is found damaged. So quality check for any damage should be done periodically. Now, many registers we have to uh, maintain in our OT, but uh, in terms of infection control, the major uh, things are you have to have OT culture reports, then uh, autoclave or ETO uh, process register, validation record for autoclave in ETO, which will include your bovidic and uh, biological indicators, sterilization recall records, consumables used during surgeries, OT master logbook, which will include uh, details of implant, AHU maintenance record, AHU uh, logs, checklist for OT disinfection, and OT cleaning record that will be daily in between and terminal. Now, management. Let us see how guidelines would help us in managing end of case. So, end of thermitis or any infection in, in, in respect to uh, NABH guidelines, it's known as surgical site infection. And what is the definition of it? By CDC, that is uh, control of Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, it says that infection occurs within 30 days after surgery if no implant is left, or within one year if the implant is in place. So what would be the protocol if end of thermitis happens? Uh, we all of us know, but then again we'll revise it that complete, that should be a complete recall of patients, instruments, and consumables after sealing of the OT. Observe other patients operated on the dead day. Ob uh, go through your sterilization stickers, your autoclave and uh, ETO process registers. Re-sterilize everything. Uh, about your intracremal drugs and other consumables, uh, go through a consumable register, inform your vendors about this. For IELTS also inform your vendors. Then OT disinfection with culture reports and again CSSD validation by biological indicator. And always have detailed documentation of all these processes which you have done and investigation and treatment given. And of course consent, just go through your consent, it carries legal value in such a uh, problem. Now, as per guidelines, any end of we have to take it up as an adverse event or incident and we have to report it. So we will be reporting it as an incident reporting and then after reporting we have to do root cause analysis of the same. Now there are a couple of tools to do root cause analysis. The, the 5 why is the simplest tool where you ask why five times. Like suppose the statement is infection happened. Why infection happened? Protocol was not followed. Why protocol was not followed? There was a lack of awareness. Why there was a lack of awareness? Lack of training. So on. So last is lack of communication and callous attitude by the staff. So how to rectify this? By just training, training, and training. Repeated training to your staff. Again, this is the another method to break down all the root causes. This is known as fish boss, uh, fishbone analysis, where uh, you can say that uh, there can be a breach in sterilization, endogenic factors, contaminated solution, inefficient disinfection. Like in breach in sterilization, what would have gone wrong? There was no validation of your autoclave machine. Endogenic factors, probably patient never revealed that patient was suffering from some chronic illness like syphilis or so. Now these adverse events, again, after doing root cause analysis, you have to do CAPA. What is CAPA? That is corrective action and preventing action. So what is corrective action in this? We give treatment properly. We did investigation. Maybe patient refer to higher center and all those things. And OT disinfection and surveillance again of OT and CSSD. Just remember, CSSD surveillance of autoclave is only by biological indicator, not just by bovidic or anything. But once you do biological indicator, then it is uh, said that it is completed. Then preventive action. Preventive action we have to take because it should not happen in future. So what would be the preventive action? After doing RCA, we'll come to know where we have gone wrong. 
So do policy change, like in cleaning, disinfection, sterilization, or instrument cleaning. If you want to change some policy somewhere, change in consumables or change in supplier or medication recall or and then alert. Now you can see these two pictures which is going around. This is the recent development. The Intasol, which uh, one batch has caused some problem to, in two, three places. So this kind of alert should be given to our colleagues as well as to the manufacturers and then uh, uh, DGI. Uh, uh, this, uh, sorry, I'll tell you. DGCI. Huh? Huh? DGCI. DGCI. And then all these things uh, should be uh, uh, documented properly. So all those things which you have done, the processes should be documented properly. And in your committee meetings, again, you have to discuss all these things. After committee meeting, you have to uh, train your staff with new policy and procedure. And the most important thing is review of uh, training effectiveness. We train our staff, but they don't implement anything. So how would you review? Repeated training, repeated uh, questioning to them, and then uh, post uh, training, you can take some uh, uh, classes also, test also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jalpa. The next talk will be given by Dr. Ajay Arora. He is the Vitrio Retina Fellow of UC San Diego, USA. He is the Vitrio Retina Consultant of Vision Plus Eye Center and Delhi Retina Center. He will be talking on clinical diagnosis of endophthalmitis and differential diagnosis with TAS. Uh, thank you very much for the invite to this course. and. Uh, so I'll be talking on, can I have my slides? So I, before I start, I'll tell you a small little story which uh, happened about 10 years back. Uh, some patients were being referred from a place in Uttarakhand and uh, we started getting uh, end of cases from them and uh, they were turning out to be fungal endophthalmitis and it'll keep happening from the same institute every few weeks and the surgeon was brilliant and he got perturbed, he closed down his OT, did everything and then when everything was ruled out, on the phone I told him, why didn't you take a swab for the undersurface of your operating microscope? That is the lens. They took a swab from there, we grew the same organism which we were growing in the end of cases. So it's very important to think out of the box when you're having cases like this, because you might, after following all the protocols, still not hit the nail on the head, okay? So I'll go ahead with this clinical diagnosis, differential diagnosis. And so basically end of cell mitis, you can diagnose by history. You will have history of a surgery having happened, diminution of vision, you can have pain, chemosis, then you can have uh, signs of inflammation where you have redness, ciliary tenderness, aqueous flare, hypopion, pupillary membranes, poor view of the fundus, vitreous exudation, and you may not be able to see much then you diagnose by ultrasonography uh, findings, which suggest that there's endophthalmitis, and then you do the lab investigations, where you can do a, 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 a tap, where a vitreous tap, eco-tap, do a gram stain, KOH, culture and sensitivity. So it's actually become extremely important for us to differentiate between and in endophthalmitis, which is not infective, or we can call it a sterile endophthalmitis or TAS, and a uh, infective endophthalmitis. So this particular term actually was coined many years back in 2006. Uh, we really don't know the exact incidence because they, they sometimes they get uh, treated, they are mild cases, they're treated like post-operative inflammation. And uh, it's important, however, to know that there are multiple causes, as Dr. Jalpa has just said, that you, have, you can have causes like detergents and enzymes in the instrument tubings, your ETO gas so residues, talc from the glove, or you can have uh, residues within the solutions which you use during your surgeries, the preservatives in them, all of them can cause it. So this is a table which basically differentiates what TAS is. If you have lid swelling, chemosis, and pain, then you think in terms of uh, infective. If you have a corneal edema, which is limbus to limbus, you think in terms of TAS. If you have a localized edema, then you think in terms of infection. The IOP is generally in infection, not increased, but it may be initially high in TAS and then can come down. On B scan, you will have vitreous opacities by which you can actually differentiate and culture definitely is. So this is just an example of a patient who had, uh, was a non-diabetic, post-RK, underwent cataract surgery, this is how the patient followed over a period of time with intensive steroids, 
no intravitreal antibiotics. So it's important for you to know how much uh, trauma was caused during the surgery and for you to know that your protocols are good and whether antibiotics are required. Another patient of TAS, patient did well, just with intensive steroids, of course with topical antibiotics and no intravitreal injections. So once you uh, are suspecting, it's important to be know how to, uh, you know, how to uh, take the sample, how to transport it, and how to send it for cultures. So these are some of the examples, the two-handed technique, where you can uh, um, uh, do it with a 26-gauge needle, and this was done by Harry Flynn, where you can do it on a, on a scalp man, and uh, this is during a vitrectomy, where you can do it before you start a vitrectomy, you can do it in the cutter itself. So once you've got the sample, you can, in, in your own, this thing, you put it in an ETO bag, transport it, or store it at, um, at four degrees Celsius and transport it later, or you can directly inoculate in, the op in your operation theater. And for that, you need all these samples so that you can, you, you have to have all these in your operation theater to do it, or you send it to the lab for doing it, because you need to reach a diagnosis. So if you have uh, a pseudomonas growing in, then you can suspect that it is from the supplies. That means all your instruments, all the solutions. If it is a staphylococcus or gram positive, then it could be from the personnel. That means your OT staff could be the source of infection. And if it is bacillus, then you can think many of many people still send their OT clothes to somebody to wash dry and send it back. We don't know how they are drying. They may not have dryer. They put it on the roadside. Usme dust aati rati hai, and then the same clothes come inside. So all these things are a problem and you need to know. Then you can have PCR diagnosis. You can do it with exciton, which is in by these all DNA based diagnosis. And they have various protocols, various organisms, and you're able to get the diagnosis very rapidly. Look at this report which came out from EVS and LVP. The difference is that we have a higher percentage of gram-negative bacillus as what came out in the EVS study, and that is important for us to know. The incidence of, we, there's a high incidence of gram-positive cocci, but also of gram-negative bacilli, which is, which is extremely important. Now, it's important to know that what, supposing you have, you have get a case, what clinical signs would help you to differentiate a reaction in the AC on day one after cataract surgery? So you must be able to correlate with surgical trauma. You must be able to see if there's a vitreous involvement and then take a decision. Then a question is normally asked, when should I call my patient after cataract surgery? It should be day one, day two, day three, day four. You sh usually it should be within the first three days because if it is a, if it is a very severe endophthalmitis, it will present within 12 to 24 hours. But if it is slightly less severe, at least within first three days, you must see your patients. Now, endophthalmitis hence can be classified as acute, subacute, or chronic, or it can be classified based upon the, the, the etiology, or it can be exogenous and endogenous endophthalmitis. So uh, acute post-operative, uh, post-cataract surgery endophthalmitis typically is because of staph epidermidis, but then you can have it because of uh, Staphylococcus aureus, other Staphylococcus species, Pseudomonas and all can also cause, but commonly is Staph epidermidis. Now this is a case who presented and there was a hypopion. So when you have a hypopion, it is always better to err on side of infection. You can, this is just to show you that you can treat your patients extremely well with intravitreal antibiotics. Patient was given Bancocepta, patient was followed with topical and systemic, uh, uh, topical antibiotics, systemic antibiotics and topical steroids. And over a period of time, patient uh, did well. So it's very important in 90% of these cases, if you intervene on timely manner, you can treat these patients with intravitreal antibiotics alone. Now comes bleb-related endothelmitis. This can be caused more commonly by streptococcus species and also by hemophilus influenza. And these are some of the risk factors which are there. And you can have infection of the bleb, which you can see it uh, clearly. And this has been, you can look it up. There is a classification which says what are the stages of bleb-induced endothelmitis and how you should intervene when you have different uh, stages of endothelmitis caused, uh, which is bleb-related. Post-traumatic endothelmitis, usually you have to look in terms of bacillus cereus, 
This is usually from either, de depends upon the, the, the trauma, it is either with a vegetable matter or a metallic particle, and accordingly you decide how these patients are going to behave. Now, P. acnes is a gram-positive anaerobic bacillus. It usually causes a delayed infection. It can also happen after the yak epsilotomy, and it is an interesting fact to remember that um, uh, the acne and pimples which are caused is by the similar organism, which is P. acnes. So people who have this pimples, people who have this acne, and also are undergoing surgery, the chances of P. acnes is high. This is a patient who presented with a plaque-like thing. Visual acuity was 6 by 18, and patients were treated with uh, um, vitrectomy, intracameral, and intravitreal antibiotics, and this is four weeks after past plasma vitrectomy, patient did well. So it's important to intervene timely. Then you can have fun fungal endophthalmitis, and these patients actually, uh, the, the signs are more than symptoms. The eye may be quiet. It can present as, a, so normally we were taught that fungal endophthalmitis is usually delayed presentation, but you can have it uh, you can have it within the first four days after surgery. You can have it within 10 days. You can have it after a few weeks after surgery. And this usually is a chronic, um, uh, chronic endothelmitis. Usually it's a thick hypopion which doesn't shift with position. And you can have other signs within the fundus of, uh, 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 you know, uh, snowball and fluffy opacities in the vitreous cavity. So all eyes, typically fungal endothelmitis have minimal pain and congestion. The exudation is predominantly limited to the anterior segment. And all these patients, we treated them with intracameral and uh, uh, intravitreal voriconazole with AC wash and vitrectomy, and they did well. We try to avoid uh, removing the lens, IOL, but if required, it should be done. Now, this is just an example of cases which I'll present to you because the management will be discussed later on by Dr. Chaudhary. So this is a 45 years type 2 diabetic patient, post-op day, patient uh, was treated with Vanco, Tazobac, and a microscopy was done. 48 hours later, the, the patient was not responding, had undergone a re with Vanco amikacin. The hypopene came back the next day. And then the patient said, I would like to take a second opinion. Patient underwent a second re with a voriconazole. Vitreous sample was sent for PCR, and see what happened. The vitreous sample actually grew, bacteroides fragilis. We gave intravitreal injection of imipenem. Patient responded the next day. So what I'm trying to tell you is, it's extremely important to make an organismal diagnosis. If you do not make an organismal diagnosis, you can keep on drawing vitrectomy, and you, the things won't respond. Another patient, was treated with Bancotazobact. 24 hours later, the hyperopene increased. We gave, uh, did a vitrectomy, imipenem, microscopy. Patient's microscope, uh, microbiology was negative. Uh, patient was given uh, a revit. A PCR was sent. Then we gave uh, linezolate with it. It PCR grew pseudomonas aeruginosa. Patient was then given intravitreal injection of uh, cholestin, and patient responded well. So if these are all, uh, again, organismal diagnosis will be able to save the eye. And this is uh, what happened. You must have heard of the, the, the catastrophe which happened at PGI Chandigarh. So these are some slides which I got from Dr. Vishali. There were 28 patients who received this injection of bevacizumab. And uh, this is the various uh, diagnoses for which they, they were given. All these patients, now suddenly on that day, patients were... Uh, got the one of the patients came back with infection. All the patients were called back. That was in the afternoon at 3 p.m. The smear grew gram negative, showed gram negative bacilli. Now they had to uh, pinpoint the diagnosis. So there was a test known as Malditoff, which is which had never been tested before. So they applied the Malditoff test, and by 7 p.m. They had the diagnosis of uh, the organism, and uh, this came out to be a very strange one, stenothermophilus, a pseudom pseudomonoid organism, which was uh, sensitive uh, to septazidine, the levofloxacin, cotrimoxazole, minocycline, mino and 17 vitrectomies were done in these cases. Again, I'm pinpointing that it's important to pinpoint the diagnosis. 
This is another situation. Somebody said that if you have an implant in the eye for one year, then after one year, it can't be, you can't label it as a, this is a five-year history of a patient or five-year follow-up of a patient of a chronic endophthalmitis. Patient received the two vitrectomies, 14 intraocular injections of antibiotics, multiple injections of Avastin for DME, considering it to be a masquerade. PCR was negative, vitreous cytology was negative, PET CT was negative, patient also received methotrexate, and then you have to think out of the box. So we thought how to hit the uh, organism. So what we did was, this is a small little video. I said, now the vitreous cavity had been all cleared up by multiple vitrectomies. So I decided to take the sample from the zonular area. You can see here a, uh, a, the, the specially made cannula, which is very simple, with a large 26 gauge needle. I go inside, take samples from, uh, from different sites, take samples from the aqueous humor, take samples from the zonules of both the sites. And this was then sent for, uh, you can see the uh, things coming off. And we, then we went ahead and did the vitrectomy. So these are some of the ways we took the curved cannula. And we sent, now this we sent to SN as well as Exciton. Uh, in in, in uh, SN it grew P. acnes. In Exciton it grew fusarium. Again, we are confused. So we went ahead and treated for both. And patient did well. So basically saying that organismal diagnosis is very important. I would not go into the details of indications for vitrectomy. That will be covered by Dr. Chaudhary. So in the end, <clears throat> you must be able to, uh, this is just to show you the gradient of opacity. So if, if you have an inflammation which you can't explain, think in terms of infection rather than, uh, uh, rather than inflammation. Do not ignore any symptoms of the patient. If the patient could tell, talks to you on the phone, call them for you to, to, you to your clinic. Don't answer, don't tell them, don't give advice on the phone. It's very dangerous. Uh, you must be able to document, document, document. You must be able to talk to your patients repeatedly. Do try to prove the diagnosis. Do not hesitate to give an intravitreal injections. And if you cannot handle, send it to a colleague who can do a vitrectomy. Thank you for your kind attention. So this is basically what I have already covered. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, sir. That was really enlightening. <laughs> so the next speaker will be Dr. Himanti Chaudhary. She'll be talking on operation theater layout and sterilization. I'm sorry, I may have to leave. So it's uh, um, really fortunate to be here. And uh, uh, thank you all very much. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you very much, sir. That was really enlightening, and we have really got a taste of the case-based presentation. Thank you very much. I am Dr. Haimanti Chaudhary from Silchar, Assam. I will be talking to you on operation theater layout and sterilization. The first thing that we have to know is the four pillars on which an optimal OT stands is the location and building design, patient and space utilization, safety goals, and infection control. To that, we have to add some management issues, the equipment and medication management, personal, HR, and staff training. Often the things that comes to our mind is why at all do we need an operation theater layout that is because we have to go by the approval of the government and the other professional bodies. It improves the service we give to the patients. It enhances the image of the hospital. And most importantly, it saves us from medical negligence. So in this talk, we will be covering the CME series that has been published by the ARC and distributed to all the AIOC members. It in includes the NABH guidelines as well. NABH has categorized operation theater into two. One is the super speciality OT, another is the general OT. The ophthalmology comes under the general OT category. How to maintain the sterilization will be dealt under two headings. One is the infrastructure and engineering control, another being the managerial control. While we are planning a OT, we have to have to keep in mind that there should be functional segregation from the outpatient department, 
from the indoor and also we would not want any laboratory air to get access into the operation theater. Better to avoid the ground floor, we also want our OT to be free from contamination and cross infection and it goes without saying that the construction material should be long lasting and resistant to microorganism. Basically, an operation theater complex has four zones. One is the protective zone, which houses the staff rooms and the recovery rooms. The clean zone is the intermediate between the protective and the sterile zone, and it houses the sterilization area. The third zone is the heart of the operation theater, which is the sterile zone, and the last is the disposal zone. An example of the protective zone, the clean zone, and the sterile zone, the ventilation in an operation theater should have laminar airflow with HEPA filters, which should be efficient to the level of 0 0.3 microns. It should ensure air exchanges of 20 cycles per hour. But for those who cannot afford to have that, a central AC or a split AC is as good, but there is a strict no-no to fan usage and window AC. This is how an air handling unit looks like. The water tank should be a separate one for the IoT and it should be cleaned once in a month and that cleaning has to be maintained in a register or a logbook. These are the minimum standards that has been put forward by the NABH. The temperature, humidity, air handling all needs to be maintained according to the prescribed guidelines. The occupancy should be limited to eight persons and even the equipment load should be limited to seven kilowatt. The flooring should be seamless, it should be non-porous and smooth, and most importantly, it should be repeatedly cleanable easily. The walls should have an antibacterial and antifungal paint, dust-proof and moisture-proof. The door should have a self-closing device, and it is always a good idea to have a separate power supply for the costly machines like microscopes and FACO machines. All said and done, for entry level ophthalmic surgeons who are just trying to open a new operation theater, it might not be logical to think that they can afford a HEPA filter. So for them, any good system to maintain clean air and which ensures air exchange is acceptable. Of course, as I already said, a well-maintained split AC and a humidi humidity maintainer will be good. This is the design of the central sterile supply unit where the pressure has to be maintained in the negative. Pressure will be maintained negative in the soiled zone and positive in the clean zone and the sterile zone. The flow of instruments and people will be only unidirectional. There will be no bidirectional movement of unsterile instruments. A three-dimensional view of the central sterile supply department. Modular OT, for those who can afford it, this is of course the best option because this has been designed with perfection. All the operation theaters should have a disinfection room because we can clean all the stuff here and it should not be mixed with other parts of the OT. Coming to the sterilization part, which is the most important, the reprocessing of surgical instrument is of utmost importance because often the source of infection is from our instruments. So there are certain rules that needs to be followed when we are doing the cleaning of the instrument. The cleaning should be done immediately after use. There should be a separate dedicated cleaning staff who will be looking only after the cleaning department and not those staff who are assisting us in the OT. The blunt and sharp instruments should be separated. They are first rinsed in the distilled water, processed in the ultrasonic cleaner, and then cleaning is done by the four bowl technique. The first two bowls contain antiseptic solution and the second two bowls, which are again the instruments are dipped into, contains distilled water. The sharp instruments tips are clogged with silicon plugs and then they are dried and kept as set in stainless steel trays. The processing of hollow instruments is important because we have lot of 
Please come here. Yeah, okay. We have lots of hollow instruments in our vitrectomy, FACO machines. All the hollow instruments, the irrigation aspiration cannula, as well as the FACO handpiece, needs to be flushed with distilled water three times. That flushing, as you can see here, is being done with a 60 cc syringe and not a 10 cc syringe. Thrice will flush with distilled water, will throw that distilled water, and thrice the flushing will be done by air. So that makes a six times flushing. After the instruments have been washed, cleaned, and scrubbed, we want to dry it. The drying in our roti is done by a hair dryer because any amount of moisture left behind often causes rusting, and we do not want the instrument life to be lessened. So we dry all our instruments with a hair dryer. After that is done, it is packed. The packing is separate for steam autoclave and for ethylene oxide. For steam autoclave, the packing is with linen, double layered linen. And on each layer, the chemical indicator strip are attached and date and time is written on that. And for ethylene oxide, the packing is separate, which have indicators which change color after the sterilization process. Most of the linen and metallic instruments are done on a horizontal autoclave. A vertical autoclave is not preferred because this has no vacuum system. The, all the autoclave instruments should be used within 48 hours and autoclave logbook must be maintained. For heat labile instruments like tubings, vitrectomy cutters, lenses, ethylene oxide gas sterilizer is used. It takes usually six hours, but since the gas is quite toxic, so a uh, aeration period of 72 hours is required. This is just a glimpse of the ethylene oxide sterilizer. The instruments are individually packed. They are put inside the ETO machine. An amount of moisture is put. It is locked. The vacuum is activated. The temperature is set. And when the requisite temperature has been set, the machine will be turned off after six hours. How do we know that our sterilization is up to the mark? This has to be validated with different indicators like physical, chemical, and biological indicators. Now coming to the operation room and corridor cleaning, some part of it has been covered by my previous speaker, but still I'll repeat a few things because these are very important. No dry dusting, as has already been mentioned. Wet mopping with bacil acid and formalin fumigation, though it is not preferred by the CDC, but still we, many of the OTs are still continuing with the formalin fumigation. It can be done in two ways, either aerosol spray or if aerosol spray is not available, it can be done by mixing with potassium permanganate. And on the next morning, the fumes are neutralized with liquid ammonia. For a running OT, fumigation should be done once a week. For someone who is a startup OT, fumigation needs to be done on three consecutive days and three negative culture needs to be attained. There are certain new devices, as has been mentioned, like alkadol, bacil acid, and all the fumigation process should be documented. We do the cleaning with a three bucket approach where the first bucket contains the water, the second one contains an antiseptic solution, and the third bucket contains bacil acid. This is the cleaning protocol. The roof cleaned three monthly, wall and floor daily. The refrigerator should be cleaned weekly. The sink and all the OT furnitures will be cleaned daily, and the HEPA filters will be cleaned three monthly. Thank you very much for your kind attention. The next speaker will be Dr. Himadri, who will be speaking on the management part of endophthalmitis. A very good morning to one and all present here. At the very outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Himanti Chaudhary and uh, 
Ajay Arora sir and Satanshu Mathu sir for giving me this opportunity. I'll be just covering the basics of endophthalmitis medical management and uh, intravitreal injection and I'll be just touching on a few surgical aspects as well. So I have no financial disclosures. So this is a picture which we all are scared of but once we have it in front of us we all should know how to just go about managing it. So what are the goals of treatment? We need to kill the invading organism, arrest the damage and arrest the host inflammatory response. What options do we have? We have antibiotics, surgery, and corticosteroids. Intravitreal injection is the only surefire way to reach the adequate concentration of drug required in the vitreous. Topical drops and subconjunctival injections are not adequate, and they do not reach the adequate concentration required. About systemic medications, there have been a few studies. A few drugs do reach the vitreous in adequate concentration. Aminoglycosides do not. So most of our experience of endophthalmitis is based on the results of endophthalmitis vitrectomy study which was published way back in 1995. It concluded that there was no role of systemic antibiotics, routine parsimonia vitrectomy was of substantial benefit only in patients where visual acuity was PL or less and there was no role of immediate vitrectomy in patients who had a visual acuity better than perception of light. So now after so many years, is there a role of systemic, systemic antibiotics? Well, EVS says that it prolongs hospital stay, increases cost, and increases the systemic side effects without much of a benefit. But the ground reality is slightly different. Most ophthalmologists feel more secure when we add an oral antibiotic. Systemic medication also prolongs the duration of MIC, and it has a better chance of killing all the viable organisms. So a survey of ophthalmology in August 2017 published a major review on the management of endophthalmitis and a few modifications of the EVS protocol were proposed. So after the diagnosis, a vitreous tap and injection was indicated, but along with that, oral antibiotic was also added to the protocol. So we mostly go for uh, oral fluoroquinolones or linezolid, and after the initial treatment, if there was no response, it was noted that a repeat injection was not of much value and those patients who did not respond to the initial treatment were recommended to undergo a vitrectomy within 48 hours. So these are the few antibiotics which can be used systemically. Most commonly we prefer ciprofloxacin in the dosage of 750 milligram twice daily. So Acute endof and again delayed post of endof have slightly different organisms which cause the disease. So in acute, we usually have coagulase negative staff, staff and uh, delayed post-op, we have propionobactam acnes. So these are the indicators of a very highly virulent organism. So we need to monitor and we need to uh, use, choose our approach accordingly. So in patients who approach, uh, who patients who present within two days of surgery with only light perception vision or who have wound abnormalities, corneal infiltrate or a hypopian greater than 1.5 millimeter, these usually indicate a very highly virulent organism. So we might just have to be more aggressive in our approach. So in most cases, our first choice is vancomycin and ceftazidime, and our second choice is vancomycin and amikacin. So vancomycin takes care of the gram-positive organisms. Ceftazidime takes care of the gram-negative organisms. Uh, however, amikacin is our second choice because there is a risk of macula infarction and drug resistance. For fungus, as Dr. Arora mentioned, uh, we usually go for voriconazole or Amfo-V. And for bacillus cereus, we usually prefer clindamycin. Now, vitreous biopsy is essential for uh, recovering the sample for microbiological uh, evaluation. But we do not need a complete pasplena vitrectomy. Usually, we prefer a vitreous tap using a cutter rather than just a needle because this avoids retinal traction it avoids a negative tap. So single port vitreous biopsy is a relatively easy option and should be performed by all ophthalmologists. It yields an undiluted sample. So this is the setup you need for uh, injection if you're planning for an intravitreal an uh, antibiotic. So I'll be talking briefly about the preparation of the drugs. Vancomycin, as you know, we need one milligram in 0.1 ml. 
we do not need to memorize how to make the drug. We should have all a chart in our OR. So in case of 500 milligram, we use 10 ml of sterile water for injection. This can again vary depending upon the strength of vancomycin which we have got. So for 500, we use 10 ml of sterile water. We then mix it well with the powder. And we have to remember to take a new needle in every step. We take 0.2 ml of the solution. And again, once we are adding water, we have to change the needle. This is very important. At every single step, we need to change the needle. When we are, whenever we are drawing the drug or we are drawing sterile water for dilution. So we mix it well by rotating motions and we allow a bubble to move up and down. Once that's done, we again change the needle, discard the rest of the solution and keep only 0.1. We cap it and we also use a tape to mark it because we want to differentiate it from the other drug. We'll be now moving to the preparation of ceftazidime, which is one of the most commonest drugs which we use. The strength required is 2.25 milligram in 0.1 ml. Ceftazidime again comes in various strengths, one gram, 500 milligram, 250. So for one gram, we use 4.4. Again, for 500 milligram, we use 2.2 ml of sterile water for injection. Once that's mixed, we use a new needle to draw 0.1 ml of the solution. Again, remember to change the needle to draw sterile water to make it 1 ml. The drug is then mixed very well using the rotating motions I mentioned earlier. And we usually allow an air bubble to come in and move up and down. So that hel helps in mixing it well. We discard the rest of the solution, use a new needle, and the drug left is 2.25 milligram in 0.1 ml. Now moving on to the patient, we usually end off as a very painful condition in acute cases. So we prefer a peribulbar block, but we have to remember we should not apply any pressure because the wounds might leak. We do the usual povidone iodine paint using 10% povidone iodine. And then we go for the dressing and draping. So all new modern FACO machines come equipped with a automated cutter. So we can sterilize it, re-sterilize it using ETO. Now this automated cutter can be used for the vitreous biopsy procedure. So we fix it to the machine like it's recommended. We fix the aspiration. The irrigation is not essential for the procedure and the initial steps of priming the machine are basically the same when we will use our anterior vitrectomy. So now is the different step. We need this yellow adapter which comes in all IV tubing sets. We attach a 2cc syringe to one end and the other end is attached to the aspiration line of the cutter. The irrigation is kept separately because we won't be needing it in the procedure. Now we move on to the patient using a trocar we mark in the pass planar region at around 3.5 millimeter. In case you do not have a trocar, you can always use a MVR blade. So we made a stepped entry which will be self-sealing. In case there is any doubt, we can always put a suture in the end. So we examine the cutter initially before putting it inside the eye. Uh, under visualization, we start the cutting first and then we ask the assistant or the sister to start withdrawing. Once the withdrawing is started, we usually collect the sample around 0.2 to 0.5 ml in the syringe. We are supposed to stop the moment we notice any hypotony. We do not require a large amount of sample and only 0.5 ml is adequate. So this is the undiluted sample of vitreous. So once the vitreous biopsy and the sample has been collected, we cap the, need, cap the syringe and the needle is bent. And then we cap it and send it for microbiological evaluation within half an hour. The intravitreal injections can be done using 30 gauge or a 26 gauge needle. It is bevel up and we inject drop by drop very slowly into the vitreous cavity. We have to remember to use separate syringe, separate needle for the injections, we do not use the same syringe and needle because these drugs interact with each other. Once the injection is done, we remove the trocar and the wound is usually self-sealing, but in case of doubt, there is no harm in putting a suture. 
So this patient did pretty well after surgery and uh, intravital injection. However, all patients might not be this lucky. So there are certain indications when we might have to go for a pass plana vitrectomy. So in cases where there is visual acuity of PL only in highly virulent organisms, non-responders to intravitreal injections, in post-traumatic endof, we usually directly go for a pars plana vitrectomy. Again, in cases of fungal endof, delayed endof, vitreous opacification, and macula pucker. Uh, we need to know a few things about the core vitrectomy which we'll be performing. The trocar is used, and we need to visualize the infusion port first. In certain cases, the 6 mm infusion may be used. The initial steps are more or less the same. We take the sample, and then we just perform a core vitrectomy. We do not need to remove the entire vitreous. We just have to remove the central vitreous. No attempt is made to lift the posterior hyoid, and we do not go into the periphery, or we do not go close to the macula. So once we can visualize the disc and the vessels, our vitrectomy is over. We then remove the trocar system and finally go for the intravitreal injection. So even post-traumatic end of can do pretty well with the uh, pass plana vitrectomy. Now coming to the role of steroids, uh, they are supposed to reduce the host inflammatory response and the route of administration can be topical drops, systemic, but the intravitreal dosage is controversial. However, in cases of suspected bacterial end off, we might go for an intravitreal dexamethasone as well. Microbiological workup, as Dr. Aurora mentioned, we can either do it in our own OT setup or we can send it off to the microbiological lab. In cases of delayed post op end off, only a vitrectomy might not be adequate. We might have to go for a partial capsulectomy or even an IOL removal. So to summarize, early diagnosis and management can save most eyes. Even now, our first choice is vancomycin and ceftazidime. In case you are not very comfortable with a vitreous biopsy, you can also go for an AC tap. And in patients who respond, who do not respond to the initial treatment, they must go for, go for a vitrectomy rather than a repeat injection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Himatri. If there are any questions, we can take it. Thank you for your nice presentation. I have one question that if uh, there is no infection, but uh, TAS, post-operative TAS, how to identify which is the causative agent for this, that TAS? So, like Dr. Aurora mentioned, the TAS can happen because of a lot of things. One of the most important which we find is the visco residues. So, one very important point is we need to clean the instruments which we have used and we are planning to reuse immediately. We should not wait till the end of the OR day. We should not wait till we complete all the cases. There should be a staff dedicated to cleaning the instruments and the cleaning the visco residues which are there. There are certain other causes as well, like enzymes, detergents which might be used, or even the irrigating fluid. So one most important thing is to remove all residue, whatever is there in the instruments, and in case you have an instrument which is autoclaved and it still has residue, meaning the instrument is unclean, even though it has, you know, been sterilized, you should consider it to be unsterile and not use the instrument. And one more thing about the instruments that are being uh, done on ETO sterilizer. Since the ETO gas is very toxic, so an aeration period of 72 hours, that means once your ETO cycle has been switched off, you do not use that ETO sterile instrument on the very next day. You have to keep that for 72 hours and then you use it on the fourth day. That is one important thing. Even on the table, sir. 
whatever he said is, uh, you know, cleaning before operation. Even on the table, visco touching any instrument, you keep it for some time, it becomes dry white. And sometimes without cleaning, we again introduce inside the eye. So th that is, that should be very, we should be very careful that if visco has dried up on the tip of any instrument, becoming white, it should be cleaned thoroughly with wet, sterile swab and then introduced inside. So in cases uh, where we don't have a trocar, sir, right. uh, for the intravitreal injections, uh, you said we have to keep on using a newer uh, uh, needle for each injection. So do we keep on? Uh, yes, yes, yes. You use a separate needle and a separate syringe. So uh, in case you are doing it on a topical, you need to ask the patient to look away from the injection site and you use uh, povidone iodine drops and then you do the injection. You have to use a separate needle and a separate uh, syringe for both the injections. So we have to inject almost four times or three times? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Most cases you can actually find the track. You need not use a separate track every time. For our setup, we have not stopped, but CDC does not recommend the use of formaldehyde. They prescribe that the air handling units with HEPA filters, that should be good enough. And they also recommend bacillosid fogging. But for our setup, we, we do fogging, but we still use once a week, we do formaldehyde fumigation. Yeah. Uh, hi, ma'am. I am uh, working for Indian Railways since the last three or uh, four months after just passing out my uh, MS. I uh, want to know your opinion uh, regarding use of uh, pre-operative uh, prophylactic systemic antibiotic. That has been mentioned by Dr. Mathur. For us, we usually start uh, two days prior, but of course that does not seem to have much role because uh, Fluoroquinolones only has some roles at in attaining pharmacological levels. Uh, so you could use two days prior to the OT, fluoroquinolones. That's all. If there are no more questions, we'll uh, close the session. Thank you very much. For those who have not got the handout, I can uh, mail you the soft copy of the handout. Uh, you can get my mail ID from the counter here, audiovisual counter here.